I was uh, I was told I was allowed to give the keynote in this. So. Uh, thank the organizers for that. I got worried yesterday when I was looking at the website and it said Deutschsprachige Konferenz. And I thought, oh, hmm, I think I know all these words. <coughs> but I'm not sure I want to test it. So most people call me Dan. My name is Jeffrey McGuire. And uh, just like that sounds, I don't come from here. I'm from Cologne. <laughs> that joke works really well in German. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so let's see if we can do this. So, I think we're missing a pin. Which pin are we missing? RGB keys. This is not an art presentation, but um, it would be cool if you could, if you could find another cable while I get started, just because it's not actually supposed to be quite that purple. <laughs> <laughs> so idealism as code from philosophy to empowerment. I have the great privilege of doing a lot of public speaking as part of my job. And this thing happens, somebody invites you somewhere to speak and you come up with this cool title, and then you write down some things that you think are really interesting that you probably want, you know, that other people hopefully will find interesting. Um, but the conference isn't for a few months, so, you know, and then you come back just like, oh, hmm, huh, I'm supposed to talk about this stuff, that's well, uh, you know, I got as far as the abstract. Um, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so this is the beta one version. Um, and um, thank you for being my testers. So idealism is code. I want to talk today, I want to talk about idealism and, and open source communities um, and some of the great things we're doing and some of the problems I see in the world. And, and uh, you know, I want to ask you and all of us and all of our colleagues in the free Libre open source software movement um, to, to make a difference in the world, yeah? Um, so idealism as code is, 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 is kind of interesting uh, to me. There is a Drupal application. It runs on whitehouse.gov. It's called We the People. And um, 200 and several years ago, uh, the United States was still a very new country, and it made this thing uh, called the Constitution, and it uh, announced uh, that people have all sorts of, of fundamental rights. And one of those rights was, uh, is to petition the government to effect change. Um, but when you have a, an enormous country like the United States, it, 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 visit the, the, the landmass of the place is, is, is ridiculously large, and you don't have digital technologies, it's really, really hard to do that. And so now, all of a sudden, in the, in the are we in the digital age, or is it already the post-digital age? I was, somebody was talking about that recently. Um, in the digital age, we have these technologies that let us communicate and that empower um, regular people, right? Open source, I can download it at, at no cost, and I can start something, and I can communicate my needs, my build com community, whatever. So all of a sudden, digitally, the citizens of the United States have the power to digitally ask the government to effect change in the real world. So when I, idealism is code, right? Um, these really abstract, this code, these, the, you know, when I started, you know, basically the green or the orange on the black, that stuff, right, was very abstract. Now, we make a difference in the real world. So, one of the differences this made, this particular uh, petition made in the real world, uh, secure resources and funding and begin construction of a national death star by 2016. Um, so it got 34,435 signatures. One change that was made is that um, this application now requires 100,000 digital signatures before the government will respond. Um, the Obama administration's answer to this was also very interesting. It began with, this is not the petition response you're looking for. <laughs> 
and then went on to point out that, that you know, basically in, in times of economic crisis, there's just not the money to build this, not to build this thing right now. Most people call me Jam. I am the open source evangelist at Acquia. Uh, you can find me online. Um, very active um, at acquia.com slash podcasts. I put up my talks um, at least half of the time on SlideShare. Um, I do a lot on Twitter, that's my email. I'm really happy to talk with you uh, for the next couple of days or at any time virtually. Uh, my username, Horn Cologne, I am a musician and I fell into this world because I had a chamber music group and we needed a website and as musicians we couldn't afford to pay anyone. And uh, my best friend, who is that guy, um, happens to be here as well, uh, was doing Drupal and hey, presto, open source, you know, jam. This is, oh, you know, this is HTML and this is CSS and you can do this stuff. You can build your own website. And uh, anyway, uh, I fell down a very deep, very beautiful hole. Um, I just played some concerts at Naples last weekend and putting up a couple videos on YouTube of that uh, later today. So yeah, just because I do this other thing too. Acquia is a Drupal products and services company. Um, we help a lot of uh, especially enterprise and government customers succeed with open source, specifically with Drupal, um, and it's a pretty great place to be. It's a very, very, really uh, interesting combination of truly open source um, ethos and, and doing <coughs> fairly big business, and the company contributes a lot. Um, we employ something like 10 full-time Drupal contributors, core contributors, so, so it's, it's, it's a pretty cool place to work, and, and I think open source evangelist is, um, I think it's a pretty cool title, so. Um, how about you? Who here is a Symfony or PHP or open source service provider doing open source work for clients? Oh, that's not very many. Cool. And who does all of that stuff inside an organization like a company or a university or uh, someplace? Okay. All right. And who's doing, who's building, who's building your own stuff on open source software? And your side, who's got a side project? Keep your hands up. Who's got a side project? Uh, okay. All right, all right. And uh, who's got a side project? <coughs> no, you can admit it. It's cool. It's cool here. <laughs> right. Who contributes to open source? Who contributes to... Come on, really? When I say contribute, see, I come from the Drupal world. Um, do you organize events? Do you write bug reports? Do you download other open source projects? Do you go to open source events? Do you write code? Who contributes to open source? Thank you for your contributions. This is really, really important. It's really, really important. Hey, is there anybody here who's looking to hire developers? Okay. You want to stand up so everybody can see who you are later? <laughs> Great, cool, thank you. So, um, PHP is a, a dominant web technology. Uh, we're part of the LAMP stack and we, you know, we, PHP, run more or less 80% of the web. Um, even though I have conversations almost every day with people like, PHP is the worst language ever, man. <laughs> it totally sucks. And so, okay, but it's still running 80% of the web, so that's, there's something, it's gotta be sucking in a really, Interest. I mean, that's pretty productive, right? Uh, I didn't want to go there. Um, and we've got this thing called the PHP Renaissance going on, right? Um, with Composer and with the PSR standards and with all this, like, with, with Drupal adopting Symfony components into the 8 version, so the inside of Drupal just looks like a dialect of, of Symfony. And, you know, all these external libraries and, and frameworks being compatible with each other, like, all of a sudden, um, uh, we remember that we can be a big community too, and we're talking. And and, and when when people from Drupal contribute to the Symfony rooting component, um, you know it makes Drupal eight better, and it makes Easy Publish better, and it makes Symfony CMS better, and it makes anyone else who wants to use the Symfony full stack better. Right? It's an amazing time to be in PHP. It's really really exciting, right? And we're doing things. And this is a completely random selection, but I mean, you know, PHP runs. But Adam is the international's web presence, and it runs 
uh, NASA's web presence, and um, it, 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 it's a powerful tool for governments, universities all around the world. Um, you know, my favorite, Tesla, uh, Tesla's website, well, it's a Google website. I mean, first of all, I'm crazy about electric cars. Um, but that that's open source, it's, it's fantastic, right? So this is a really, really exciting time to be in, in PHP and we're making the world a better place. Um, but we have some problems, okay? We have, um, we have um, obviously, the situation with the NSA, uh, with the German Secret Service, with the British Secret Service, with the Australian and New Zealand Secret Services, and probably every other Secret Service in the world who can more or less see what we do um, online, and then we're stupid enough to have, I mean, so we fall for this stuff, right, for the cell phones. Um, we all have these, and we, we love them, and, and you install an app, and you give all the permissions that you want, right, but you, how, I don't, I'm talking about this, I don't do that, I don't read the end user license agreements. Um, I try to be careful about what I use, but we're also installing spyware on our own devices regularly, and it's really, really hard to know whether you're safe. Okay, who here can compile, compile and install Debian on their own laptop? <coughs> right now, we feel we have this, and it's—I mean, it's easier than it used to be, right? But that's—you got to know some stuff. You got to be in the technical <laughs> to be able to do that, right? So we're really extra empowered, and maybe if we go to great, great, great lengths, we can. Um, feel secure, think we're secure, I'm not sure whether we are. But we need to move in, in, you know, we who are building the web, we're moving to the next generation of, I mean, websites, it's starting to sound a little bit old fashioned to talk about building people websites, right? This uh, interconnected digital technology, watches and refrigerators and cars and everything else, um, we're building that, and a lot of that is going to work through the browser somehow, or the data that's coming from that is going to come from, from our backends, or we're going to be controlling it from our backends. Um, we're privileged, right? We're gatekeepers. We control this stuff, and we have the ability to do better than build a flashlight app that then sends all of my data to a marketing company, right? That's bullshit. Um, we're privileged, and we should build safe and secure applications by default. Okay? And they should be easy to use and they should be compelling and they should be there for dummies, okay? We shouldn't be building solutions where you have to RTFM to be able to use it. I think that we have a responsibility to empower and protect people who are not as ta technically savvy as we are and I think that we have the ability to do that with our startups, with our products, with our applications. So that's my challenge to you and that's um, kind of the background of everything I want to talk about today, and it's all um, kind of just perspectives on how I've been thinking about this and how I got to this. Um, I met Errol Balkan recently, he's a really, really interesting guy, we hung out for a day. Um, he said a couple of very, very smart things, of, of course. Um, he pointed out, though, that digital rights are human rights. So if, um, you know, I think we um, would all agree uh, that racism is bad, and that homophobia is bad, and that sexism is bad, so I think that, um, you know, I think that we should put privacy and security and, and being safe on that on those lists of uh, of human rights. Um, and we have, the, I think, we have a responsibility to enable other people to enjoy freedom, right, and privacy and security. Um, we can do really cool things. We do empower people. Uh, the DrupalCon Portland got together. There was the uh, terrible, terrible uh, tornado in Oklahoma City in May last year, and. Um, 70 Drupalists got together and said, we're going to hack on this, and 24 hours later they released this app which let, um, uh, which let people in that disaster area uh, ask for help and, and, and give help, and it's great, and of course it's open source code, I believe it's been used in other situations now, but um, you know, this is, this is idealism as code, right? This is really empowering people, and um, DrupalCon did this faster than any government body but immediately put it at the government's disposal, immediately put it at the disposal of people. So we, we can do something about problems that we see in the real world. Um, I gave another talk which unfortunately just doesn't fit into this one. I wanted to translate it in. It's called Do Something About It. And basically, we are fundamentally enabled by an open source software to make a difference. So, we're a bunch of uh, idealists, right? Um, I don't know this crowd as well as I might know 
a Drupal crowd, but um, an awful lot of people I know in open source software started out because they wanted to do something for their school. They wanted to do something for the students. They, they, they were involved in a protest movement, in some sort of activism, in political organizing. Um, so, so open source comes from a really idealistic place a lot of times. In 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, was giving a speech. It's now called the State of the Union. It's something the United States pres President has to do every year. Um, and he outlined, who's heard of the four freedoms, by the way? Free software definition, right? Yeah, well, so, so the four freedoms, right? Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, people should have the freedom of speech and the freedom of worship and the freedom from want, which is a really lovely way to say that in English. Um, the freedom from want is we should have our material need basics and material needs taken care of. And the freedom from fear, okay? 1941, this was a bad time um, around here. So, so this is really, really a, a very idealistic statement. Uh, it, this went through a couple more iterations and became part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations in 1948. So um, that's something that's, uh, I think groups like ours are, are, are unified and, and, and motivated by, by really idealistic statements like that. Fast forward to 1986, this guy, okay, Attention, we are living in a world in which Richard Stallman was absolutely right, and he was always right. Whatever we thought before. So in 1986, Richard Stallman wrote this amazing thing, the free software definition. The first published version of this is two statements. Um, the word, well, it's three, actually. So the word free in our name does not refer to Christ, it refers to freedom. First, the freedom to copy a program and redistribute it to your neighbors so that they can use it as well as you. Second, the freedom to change a program so that you can control it instead of it controlling you. For this, the source code must be made available to you. Right? It's very powerful. That turned into what we call the four freedoms in uh, open source software. Freedom to run the program. Uh, freedom to study how it works. Freedom to redistribute it. And freedom... Uh, uh, so, right, and I don't like this because I think that freedom two and freedom three in this list, the freedom to redistribute your copies so you can help your neighbor and the freedom to distribute your copies of modified versions seems to, anyway, this is really important. And it's a very idealistic statement and we derive an incredible amount of benefit from this today. Um, who's heard of Bruce Perrins? He wrote a thing as part of the Debian project originally called the open source definition. And the open source definition, which is here on opensource.org slash OSD, is really, really interesting. And he did a really typical thing, I think. It really screams open source to me. Instead of two statements, simple statements, instead of four simple statements, the two of which are kind of redundant, um, he wrote 10 statements. So uh, the open source bike shed, right? Let's discuss this. Let's consider every edge case, right? Um, and it goes in, free redistribution, source code, uh, program must include the source code, license must allow modifications and derived works, the integrity of the author's source code, no discrimination against persons or groups or fields of endeavor, um, specifically about the license, license, and, um, and it's interesting, but, um, and we talk about open source, and we're open source practitioners, and there's open source businesses, and everybody's open source now. Um, Unlike, and I'm quoting from this website, unlike new creator Richard Stallman, Perrins believes that free software and non-free retail software can coexist. Perrins software universe consists, consists of three paradigms. Traditional retail software, in-house development software, and open source. Um, and the open source movement, you know, it was promoted by Tim O'Reilly and Bruce and a lot of other people. And, I mean, it's, the fabric of our everyday lives. Um, essentially, it's, it's talking about the coexistence of your ability to use all this code, but um, talking sort of 
it's very pragmatic, how you can do business with this, how you can, how it can coexist with all these things that, that Richard um, points out are dangerous. And so it's pragmatic, it's very useful, um, it's a little bit less idealistic. My take on this, as idealistic as I am, and as important as it is that um, I think we should not be spied on by our governments um, without cause, and I don't think that, uh, you know, and I think that we should have the fundamental right to be free in the use of our devices, right? Um, it's much easier for me to be an idealist when I can pay my rent, okay? So I'm very pleased to be working for an open source company that's able to um, make money with this stuff. So it's, um, it's a tough balance, it's a tough balance. Who knows this logo? <laughs> the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aha, uh -huh. it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Yeah, so this is the Burning Man logo. And, and um, Burning Man is, you know, a big party and all this other stuff, but who knew, it's actually, it's actually defined by a, a, a very idealistic set of principles um, and the way they organize their events and interacting with each other very, very, very strongly reminds me of how the best functioning open source co uh, communities treat each other. Um, radical inclusion, uh, radical self-reliance, you know, like, go write that patch, man. Don't, tell, don't complain about it, go, you know, that sort of thing. Um, civic responsibility, communal effort, participation. This is all stuff that we can really get on board with as open source people. Um, I have the privilege of talking with a lot of people about open source, and I boil down the pragmatic uh, definition because I speak with uh, businesses and governments um, often, and I speak with open source service providers about how they can sell their services better to businesses. Um, you're free to use it, you're free to study it, you're free to modify it, and you're free to share it. Um, and of course, um, this slide itself is then another hour of, of talk, but nobody can take this stuff away from you, right? Um, you, 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 you're not gonna, they're, we're not gonna sunset um, Symphony 2 and turn it off, right? So that you have to upgrade to Symphony 3, that's not gonna happen. Um, as a business person, you are enabled to uh, mitigate risk and make the best informed decisions possible. You can look at the source code, so, you can understand whether it's good enough, whether it's safe enough. Um, you have, you have um, code repositories like Drupal.org uh, where the good code um, uh, thrives and gets improved by more and more people using it and the bad code goes away because everybody can see that it's bad, right? So it's, it's really Darwinian. Um, you can make it exactly the tools that you need. You can start off with this powerful kit of Legos that we kindly provided for you, and then you can make that exactly the house, exactly the racing car, exactly what you wanted. Um, and that change, when you build a distribution to manage your government department, when you figure out how to solve some problem, you can build a business with that. You, you know, it's your area of expertise. You can also pass that on to everyone else in your field. Um, and and that's, that's really, really powerful. That's really, really powerful for every kind of organization. Who's read this book? Democratizing Innovation. Eric von Hippel predicted uh, quite a few years ago more or less everything that has now happened in free and open source software. And um, there's this paradigm, there's this, there's this thing that he talks about a lot in the book. Um, basically, a lot of technologies have been created by user communities rather than by manufacturers. So there's this thing where a manufacturer in the old world is someone who builds a product and broadcasts it to consumers who can passively consume it and take whatever they're given, okay? But windsurfing wasn't made that way. Some dude in his garage took a surfboard and took a sail from somewhere and screwed them together. Um, and thus the windsurfing industry, and windsurfing as a concept, as a device, that was invented, that was... Um, so we're empowered by open source because we're manufacturing it and we're using it, so we know exactly what we need so that we can build the absolutely the best tools for our clients or for our own needs, right? So this is really incredibly, incredibly powerful. This really lets us, um, I also like to talk about, oops, uh, who, who's heard of Larry Lessig? Lawrence Lessig, inventor of Creative Commons, Harvard Law professor. He's now uh, involved in 
the area of corruption in government, and he's not talking about bribery, he's talking about, in general, he's talking about the corrupting influence of money in the system, and it's very interesting if you care about that stuff. Um, but in the introduction to this book called the One, uh, One Way Forward, he talks about interviewing people a, f a couple of years ago in the United States political scene, uh, people from the uh, Tea Party, uh, a specific faction of the Tea Party, who are about as right wing as you can get in the US and still be legal, um, and people from the Occupy Wall Street movement who are, you know, absolutely the polar opposite to them. They're really the extremes of the political scene at the time, and both groups of people said, oh hey, but we're open source. We're open source political movements. We're taking people's ideas, we're iterating on them, we're taking any good concept and we're trying it, right? And open source provides the fastest possible rate of improvement for ideas. I also like to talk with um, businesses with organizations about this whole thing. This is another hour of talk. I'm like, here's the difference between proprietary and open source. And the difference comes down when you have this zero license fee, right? You have this, uh, the, the download comes at a price of no dollars. Um, you're empowered to make all these smart investments in exactly when you need and you can invest in exactly um, what you want and when you need all that stuff is really great. They love, they love to hear this stuff. This is really, this is really, really great stuff. I, I talk about things like how open source enables collaboration, transparency, participation, innovation in government today around the world. I talk about a definition of successful digital business or business in the digital age, um, where a successful business needs to be innovative, save costs, be efficient, and mitigate risk. Um, and so I take these four freedoms and then I break them down across the definition that I posit to prove that it's possible and prove that open source is already doing it in the world. So my challenge to us, okay, I think that successful, free, libre, open source software, okay, so I wrote a great, um, I, I, I was very, flat, I don't know where it is now, uh, there's, a, there's a website called Tux Machines something, .net, I think, um, and it's a great <coughs> Linux open source place, it's been going for a long time, um, they interviewed me a couple weeks ago and we posted that last week online, um, look for that, it's kind of fun, it was sort of questions about, hey, what's going on in Drupal, and, um, I noticed that since I've been thinking about preparing this talk, it's getting harder and harder for me to just say open source because I think the concept of freedom is so, 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 so important. And um, yet, saying free and open source software every time, or Libra, or all this, it's very, very, it's a lot, it's a mouthful. Um, forgive me, if I say open source, if I say floss, if I say false, if I say something else, I'm talking about free slash Libra and open source software and practices and ideas. So, just so that we're there. Look, so, successful open source. By default, we should be providing <coughs> ourselves, our friends, our clients, our world with safe, secure, compelling, empowering solutions. By default. Compelling means it has to look good and it has to be easy to use so that someone will choose the safe, better open source option because it's easy to use because it looks good, because they can just turn it on, all right? Um, these are the kind of things that we need to be producing to make a difference in the world, to, to broadcast our ideals onto society and, you know, hopefully pull back from this sort of um, very Orwellian world that we're falling into right now. Um, what are we? Well, I've said we're idealists. Here's one of my favorite, oh, hey, so, I guess we didn't talk about getting sound out of my computer, did we? Hmm. Okay. So here's one of my here's one of my favorite Drupalists, and she's going to talk about idealism. Talk about talk about how it is that we can change the real world with our with our software stuff. <laughs>
That's what I think we should be doing. <coughs> Drupal made an interesting decision um, very, very early in, in its existence, and we've taken the very, very beautiful symphony components that you've uh, made for us, thank you very much, um, put them into Drupal 8. Uh, we put the entire power of all of the clever programming that, that our community has been doing for the last 12 years into the user interface. To build a Drupal website product application um, requires a minimum of custom code. Building and maintaining Drupal itself requires a hell of a lot of code, and it's, very, it's an exciting place to be coding nowadays. Because um, we've caught up, we've got PHP 5.4, I think, is the minimum required version, and, and you know all this cool stuff in there now. Um, but our fundamental design decision was empower the user. So we've got this UI in Drupal 8, which is an API building UI. We have a digital building business building UI. Every view in Drupal, which is a, a database query that you can build in a query building UI. Um, it's also a REST endpoint, and you can also be exported as a web service. So all of a sudden you have, in the hands of semi, you know, tech, not developer level people, but technically enabled people, you have the power, they have the power to go and, and do good stuff in the world. And it's, I think it's a really, really interesting differentiator between our community and, and uh, you know, framework communities, language communities. So, are we making the world a better place? Are we doing this? Are we getting there? Um, oh, Italian city to rent opts for Ubuntu and open office to save billions. Primary schools in Geneva switch to Ubuntu. Uh, UK government uh, switched to the ODF uh, 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 standard for documents. That's so amazing. That's so great, right? Canary Island saved 700,000 euros with open source. French National Police switched 37,000 desktops to Linux. It's like, this is good, right? Our governments are using our tax money more sensibly. Check this out. Hamburg could be the next major city after Munich to ditch Windows C in Germany. It's actually doing really well at this stuff. Okay. Check this out. Bundes 90, uh, the Green Party. Um, da -da 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 -da. Twitching to free and open source software enables innovation and increases security, and the city administration should emphasize this when selecting ICT solutions. That. That. That is a smart politician, and that's great. I'm really, really hoping Hamburg goes for this. Um, who's from Lone and Westfalen here? Hey, hello, cool. Gummelsbach. I want to sign 50,000. Gummelsbach, without announcing it at all, went and switched um, everything that they could in their city to, to open source now. They're running Linux, they're running some of the applications that the city of Munich developed when Munich went. Um, when, when Munich went open source, the Linux project, the Volumux project, all that stuff. So, and there's another, um, I was talking with a, I was talking with a Croatian economist, and his Twitter handle is Jobot Bobica, um, and he's a super smart guy, uh, Ranko Manic is his name, Jobot Bobica. And he was saying, you know, I want, for my thesis, I want to test this thing out. I think that if we, go for open source solutions, uh, then if we care about that sort of thing, we can keep our money in our own local economies, right? Since I don't have to go to some vendor in Washington State, in, you know, I don't have to just go to IBM, Oracle, uh, Microsoft, wherever it is, I can hire my three-man uh, PHP shop there and my database shop there, and. I want to study, he told me a couple years ago, I want to study the economic effect on local economies of switching to open source software, I'm going to do it with Munich. Um, and it sounds like a great idea, it sounds really, really fantastic. I met this other guy called James Stewart, and he's a G CTO of um, the Government Digital Service of Her Majesty's Cabinet in the UK. Uh, they build gov.uk, it's all open source, they're a Ruby shop, um, super, super interesting. Um, he's got maps of the budget distribution of the UK government before and after the switch to open source in the UK. And it goes from like Reading, London, Brighton, and another place which is like Oracle, Microsoft, Apple, Google, whatever it was, to this map where there are a thousand dots all across the country. It's an amazing thing. So we can support our own local economies by using this stuff that we can only control. It's awesome, right? We are kind of doing really, really well. 
Microsoft says this government switch to open source will cost this size <laughs> Okay? Microsoft said software should be chosen on the basis of file format it supports. Um, they were pushing that the UK government also adopt their OOMXL, whatever their competing format was. That you can only, however, you can only use it on Windows 7 and Windows 8. So, you know, because, you know, shouldn't be chosen on the base of file formats. Um, it supports a lot of user productivity. Now tell that to the guy who designed the ribbon interface, if any of you have seen a Windows machine in the last 10 years. User productivity. This clearly transcends the cost, or otherwise, of any license, the company said. Now, okay. Um, Adobe, Adobe engagement, uh, whatever that is, their proprietary CMS thing. Um, there's, a, there's a public video from a very recent conference of theirs. The average Adobe engagement manager, I think, is the product. Um, license deal is $450,000. And the average services package sale on top of that is two or three times that much. Okay? But how much transcendence, how much transcendence do you need to, to transcend a half a million dollars of licensing costs before you turn the thing on? I think that, I mean, how much scruple can, I mean, how much symphony can you deliver me for a half a million dollars, right? A lot. So, we think this sounds crazy, and we think it's perfectly obvious, and we think we're doing okay. <laughs> so, and I, and, you know, uh, okay, then we got, um, Berlin is using the 2010 version of OpenOffice, <coughs> and they're having a problem with file format compatibility and using their other systems, okay? And so, rather than upgrading to LibreOffice, rather than <coughs> updating their systems, um, somebody's convinced them that, you know, going back to Microsoft will solve all their problems. Now, it's great because I know that the city of Berlin's budget is balanced. <laughs> I know that, you know, the economy up here is doing great, so I think it's totally cool for them to be going back onto the licensing <laughs> situation. Yeah? So, if um, we're going to cut a real short on time now, and I apologize for that, but I want to come back to this. Um, look, hey, proprietary open source, that doesn't matter. There's this dude on the, on the internet, and he has his own proprietary CMS. And uh, I've seen him make posts that say, it doesn't matter if the CMS is open source or proprietary, it's all about features and service. I promise that mine, CMS, will do what you need, and nobody cares about the rest. Bullshit. Are you with me? Are you with me? Bullshit. Like hell, it doesn't matter, okay? This is clearly a case of bad execution by some people who are, are, are misinformed. Um, but what about helping? What about doing a hackathon with the city of Berlin? What about going to town hall? What about protesting very constructively and saying, we are the technically enabled citizens of Berlin and of Germany, and we don't want you spending, sending our taxpayer money to Redmond to fix a problem that we can fix you for the cost of some bandwidth and a couple weekends spent together in a hackathon, right? Why don't we do that? Why don't we do something about it? And as open source practitioners, we're empowered to actually fix this if they would let us. And I think that this is a cause that we should talk about. Um, the German government does not have standardized guidelines about open source use across federal or regional or local governments. And I think that this is a problem in Germany that we need to address those of us who live here. DRM's kind of a problem. This is a, just a by the by. Um, and Cory Doctorow talks about the copyright, sums up the copyright wars as uh, people policing you because you're watching television the wrong way, right? So, and, um, you know, printer ink is the most expensive liquid in the world. It's more expensive than blood or perfume or oil or anything. Um, and the price has gone up because, because, these, because these DRM protected weirdo cartridges, well, Germany does get some things right. It's illegal in Germany to produce a printer cartridge that can't be refilled. That's kind of awesome. Um, geeks of the world unite. We need a lot of caffeine to get our stuff done. Um, this Corvig brand is really popular in the US. 
How long is it going to take you to hack that DRM when you need a cup of coffee, okay? They've changed to this Coring 2.0 system. All of their own old pods, all of the competition, that, uh, the whole market that opened up around this um, is gone because the, the 2.0 machines won't, won't make you your coffee with that. I don't think it's going to last. I think it's going to be like every other kind of DM, DRM, and it's kind of, it's kind of stupid. Um, hey, so that doesn't really matter. I might not like that coffee, and I might not care about that now, but the next generation of devices are going to go in your bodies, right? You're going to be sitting in them, and uh, national governments and institutions and dictators and people who are well-meaning today, but who knows about tomorrow, are going to insist that there's a police override mode for the car. Well, do you trust that? You know, what if you're sick? What if you need to get to the hospital? What if you're in a place or situation where you don't feel safe stopping to talk with the police? Or what if somebody gets that override code? That'll never happen, right? <laughs> they make pacemakers now that are Wi-Fi. It's sort of, I don't know what it is. They're, and doctors can access them from the outside of the body. Well, nobody thought that anyone would ever want to hack those. So they're not protected, and you can, and you can kill someone. Right? So, being open source, using open source software is the only sane way to build critical systems. You don't let engineers and architects build buildings without telling you their algorithm for the load-bearing structures, right? Um, we can't be free until we're safe and secure. Errol Balkan also said, if, and this is, I love this line, if I have to say trust me, don't trust me. In open source, I can look at what you're doing. My security expert can look at what you're doing. Anyone else can look at what you're doing. And we'll decide it's okay. And we can only decide that if we have transparency. That hotbed of radical thinkers, the Norwegian Associate, National Association of Accountants, made a submission to the Norwegian government about the new cash register standard for Norway. And they said the only way that we can guarantee to avoid tax evasion was the cash registers if they're powered by open source software. Super awesome. Super awesome. Blockchain. Right? A completely audible, auditable, provably continuous chain of transactions. Think that's a good idea? It's open source. <laughs> this is a nice story. This guy is, uh, his name is Vincenzo Rubano. This is him at Drupal Com Portland. He's blind, he's been blind from birth. He's 20 now, he just graduated high school. Um, he runs a website called Kitengo Goku, which means I have my eye on you. He finds and tests and reports on software and applications that have accessibility problems. And writes all that up on a Drupal site. And he found Drupal and he started using it. Drupal is very accessible out of the box. And he was so thrilled he came and he's part of our accessibility team now at Drupal. And he runs this website. Um, and he doesn't just write these reports and put his finger. He goes and works with any developers who are willing to work with him to make their products more accessible, right? Um, but it doesn't matter that um, he's using this free and open source CMS because any paid CMS would have just let him turn that thing on and use it, right? <laughs> It does matter that it's open source. And Vincenzo's making a difference in the world. It's awesome. It's, it's, it's totally amazing. I need to see where I have my slide. Oh, good, OK. Because my thing was telling me I had 73 more slides, and it just can't be true. Look, um, very, very quickly. Um, in the US restaurant business, there's a saying my dad told me, uh, uh, you got to own the bricks. You gotta own the bricks. If you open, if you rent a place and you open a restaurant somewhere and you cook really, really great, lots of people come to your restaurants. Or a lot of it is where you are, right? Then they know where you are and they stop by and if there's a table they can eat. You do really, really well. And after a year or two, your landlord comes by and says, "Your spaghetti is fantastic. I'm doubling your rent. You know, you're so successful. I want a piece of that." And then what do you do? You can't leave. You're gonna lose all your business if you move somewhere else. But, right? If Oracle sunsets that version of software that you've invested five years of work into to build your company and your vision, and they sunset it and they tell you, December 31, we're turning that server off, we will let you upgrade to the next version. Um, and that costs 50% more license fees, right? Um, well, that kind of sucks. If you own 
building that you have the restaurant in, if you own your own infrastructure, if you build your vision of open source software, you own the bricks and you're in control of your own destiny. I highly recommend doing stuff owning the bricks. So look, successful free and open source software really, really does matter. It needs to be safe, secret, compelling, empowering by default. I think we can make the world a better place. We care about this stuff, I hope. <laughs> I know we're out of time. I'm really, really happy to talk with you. I'll be here all day and some of the morning. One last pitch, and I'm out of here. Mobro.co slash one cologne. That's me. My uncle died a month ago of prostate cancer, and I'm unhappy about it. And another uncle of mine died about five years ago of the same thing. And I really don't want to lose any more relatives or any of you or my friends to that. So if you care about this sort of thing, um, there's this Movember action about cancer research, and I would appreciate it if you care about this to make a donation um, and also help me beat everyone at my company team. <laughs> but that's that's the <coughs> so anyway. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Sensio Labs. Thank you for contributing to open source. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure.